Hello. In this video, we are going to discuss confidence intervals. In the last video, we went over the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem uh, gives us a model that we can use for finding the distribution of likely survey results that are around the actual population parameter, right? So let's say that you have uh, all adults in America and you have some, some, some specific thing you're interested in about them, like their voting affiliation or something like that. And let's say that we, and let's say that the, the, that percentage of people, this percentage of, um, of people, let's say 60% um, are, are something. Uh, that's quite a high number for Democrats or Republicans, whatever. So let's, it's a survey about something. Let's say we know that you know, somehow magically, we know that 60% um, is the actual number. If you go through and conduct surveys, you're not going to get 60% uh, on every single survey. Sometimes you're going to get 57%, sometimes you're going to get 59%, sometimes you're going to get 55% or even 50%. Okay. And so what the central limit theorem does is it enables us to go through and find the what the likely distribution is around uh, that 60%. So it's going to go through and it's going to tell us how the, the survey results, if we went through and conducted surveys on subsets, on samples uh, from that population, what those are likely to look like. Okay. So the issue with that is that to do that, you kind of need to have, you need to know what the population, the actual population parameter is. Like you actually need to know the 60% uh, before you can go through and create a model for what the distribution is likely to be around that. All right. So uh, in this video, we're going to move away from this idea that we know what the population parameter is and, and, uh, and we're interested in like finding you know, how, how results are distributed about it. Uh, and instead, we're going, to, we're going to come back to the real world. What are we actually doing with surveys? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, and let's tie this and let's again, let's tie this into the real world. All right. So in the real world, we don't know the population parameter in general. Okay, and just to refresh your memory, the P stands for the population parameter. All right, so uh, what we what we do have is is we have P hat, which is the survey results. All right, and what we're doing is so we have we have P hat. And what we're interested in doing is we're interested in taking our result for p hat and using that to say something about what p, you know, what the population parameter likely is. All right, so how can we do that? And in particular, how can we do that using the stuff that we've done in the last few videos? But to answer that, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to look at an example. Uh, so we're going to use an example to inspire um, the the method that we're going to end up calling confidence intervals. All right, so let's look at an example. All right, so in 2013, Pew Research surveyed 446 randomly selected Democrats.
So 57% said news media spend too much time on unimportant stories. So how much larger or smaller is the percentage for all Democrats likely to be? So we're looking to answer this using the stuff that we've already developed. So what we're going to do here is even though we have this 57%, this is not the population parameter, all right? This is the result of a survey of 446 Democrats. This is not the percent for all Democrats. So in the last few sections, we've had the percentage for all Democrats. This time, we don't. All we have is this sample. But despite that, we're still going to go through and do the central, we're still going to do some central limit theorem stuff. And it's just, we're going to use it in, in a different way. All right. So to go through and use it though, we need to start off by looking at the various, um, the various requirements, right? So there are three requirements to go through and use the central limit theorem. So number one, the, the survey needs to be conducted randomly. All right. So this is, this word randomly here is key. So that's number one to use the central limit theorem check we've got randomness okay uh, and then number two which we're gonna have to move to the next page here so number two we need to take the the population size and multiply by the percentage and we can use p hat okay for that uh, and that needs to be greater than or equal to 10 and we need to take the the interview number of interview size and multiply that by uh, by one minus p hat, and that also needs to be greater than or equal to 10. So we've got, uh, what, what do we have? So 57% is the percentage. Uh, so that's our p hat. And then 446 is the size of the sample, that's n. So we've got 446 times 0.57, and that needs to be greater than or equal to 10. So I didn't do the math here. Um, I just wrote, I wrote this down and just said yes. Uh, all right, so you can see 57%, that's greater than 50%, right? And 50% of 446 is over, is over 200. So uh, we got plenty with room to spare. All right, and then for this one, it's not quite as obvious, but if you do one minus 0.57, Uh, this also checks out. So this is going to be 446 times like 43%, and that's still going to be way bigger than 10. So that's not a problem. All right. So um, the second requirement for the central limit theorem is that the samples needs to be large enough that we have 10 positive and 10 negative, uh, 10 positives and 10, uh, sorry, 10 successes and 10 failures. That's where that's, that's what I was looking for. Uh, and we do have that. All right. And then in the last, the third case, the population needs to be 10 times the size. So if you take all Democrats, that's pretty obviously larger than 10 times 446. All right, so we got like 4,000. There's more than 4,000 Democrats. Okay, so uh, once we've done that, uh, what we can say is that even though we don't know what the population parameter is, we don't know what P is, again, we don't know P. Right. However, we do know that the results for P hat 
are normally distributed. around P. So even though P is unknown, we still know that there's a normal distribution, right? So this isn't in my notes, but I feel like I need to just, you know, so the idea is that if you got, a, if you have a, a normal distribution, so we've got our, our uh, normal distribution, sorry, that's my, the best curve I can do here in the spot. Uh, and we've got P here at the center, even though we don't know what this is, it's still, the center limit theorem still stands up and says that the normal distribution, there's a normal distribution around this. Um, and that normal distribution, it's the normal distribution of P hats, right? So here's, you know, the, the results that you'd get for these specific spots are various P hats, you know, would be here or here or here. You know, we've got, you know, P hat here. So all these different spots tell us various, um, ver various, it gives us the distribution information for P hat. It tells us how much p hat is here, how much is here, how much is here. There's more here, the taller the graph is, the more that there is. There's the most amount of p hat, you're gonna get the largest portion of p hat that's right at uh, p itself. And so we can look at this and we and even though we don't know what p is, we can still say that at, when the central limit theorem is satisfied that the p hats are normally distributed around p. Okay, um, we can go through and we could fix, we can go through and estimate uh, what the standard error would be there or the standard deviation, right? So we can do the standard error. Right, and that's going to be the square root. And so we could do this p hat times one minus p hat over n. So that's the square root of 0.57 and that's gonna be 0.43 over 446. And so we can go through and estimate that. And that's about uh, 0 0.023. That's roughly 0 0.023. All right. And so we can even we can even do more than say that there is a normal distribution around around P. We can even say that the standard deviation or the standard error of that distribution. And so starting at our unknown P, if we go out 0 0.023 um, in each direction, right? One standard deviation in each direction, then 68% of the results um, are organized or are, are right in the, are distributed, sorry, around, around P. All right, so this is another way of saying 68%, there is a 68% chance actually, let me do it this way. I'm changing my notes here. Uh, there's a 68% chance that a random P hat is within one standard error of P. And right, so this is a result from the central limit theorem. It says that here at the center P, if we go out one standard deviation, since it's normally distributed, if we go out one standard deviation in each direction, then that's gonna cover 68% of the P hats, meaning there's a 68% chance that a random P hat will be in that distribution. So if you take one P hat at random, there's a 68% chance it's going to be within one standard deviation. We can also say there is a 95% chance that a random P hat is within two standard deviations or two standard errors. Of P. So if we start here at the center P and we went out two standard deviations, 
uh, in each direction, then that's going to cover 95% of all of the survey possibilities, all of the p hats. And so because of that, there's a 95% chance that if we randomly selected a p hat, it would be within two standard deviations of p. So this is all just central limit theorem stuff. We're just kind of stating it here or restating it here um, for, for a purpose that is that I'm going to come to in a moment. All right, so we're, we're getting there. So I drew a visual. I don't know if this visual is strictly necessary. So it's kind of a rehash of what I just drew up there. But the idea is that if we've got P and we go out one standard deviation, actually, let me make, let me make those a little bit bigger. So if we go one standard deviation or, or standard error, the same thing, one standard deviation in each direction, then 68% six, of the time, if you do a survey, 68% of the time, your, sur your survey result is going to be in that result. So let's see, how do I want to do this? I guess we'll do it on this side. 68% of surveys which are, which we denote with p hat. Are inside that interval. Okay, so hopefully that is all stuff that you're listening and you're like, yep, yep, yeah, we got that understood. Yep, that's the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us something about the distribution of the p hats, okay, around p. And so we're just restating that that 68% of the p hats are inside of this interval. All right, now what we're gonna do here is we wanna turn this on its head though, because we don't, all of the, this whole, all the whole time I've been talking for the last few minutes, uh, we've, been, we've been saying, you know, this is true for p, okay? It's true even if we don't know what p is, all right? Um, but what we wanna do is we wanna swing it around and switch the perspective onto the p hat. So 68% of the surveys, 68% of the p hats are in this interval. What about if you switched it around and actually looked at it from the perspective of p hat instead of from p? So I'm gonna draw another line here. All right, and this time I'm gonna mark p hat. So this is p hat, that's, that's what we have. And what we can do is we can take this same standard deviation, this same size here, and we can go through and we can put that, instead of putting that around P, we're gonna put it around P hat. The same size, it was roughly be like something like this. Okay. And so um, instead of saying that 68% of surveys are inside this interval around P, we're now gonna say 68% of the time, P is going to fall into this interval around P hat. So what we're doing is we're detaching the, uh, the interval, this interval idea here from P and we're switching it over into P hat, okay? Um, and so a good question, wait, can you do that? Or, or, or what does that do? Like, you know, what's, why can you do that? All right, um, well, the idea here, you know, which is a little bit difficult to explain, but I'm gonna do my best, um, is the idea is let's say that you had a number line. So you've got zero, you've got one, you've got two, you've got three, and you've got four. And on your number line, you denote A and you denote B, okay? And so if you take these two things and, and let's, say, let's say you wrote a statement here and you said that 
A is three units away from B. All right, so we've started this off. We're talking about A. A is our focus. A is, A is the thing that is central to this statement. A is the thing that is three units from B. But looking at this, can't you also say from this, from this information here, can't you also say that B is three units from A? So doesn't this statement relating the distance between A and B that is focused on A, where B is secondary, doesn't that also tell us the, the, the necessary information to switch this around and say that B is three units away from A? All right. Uh, so the, the idea here is essentially that you're doing that. So if this is saying that the P hat are, you know, 68% of the P hat are in this interval around P, then this, that's the same thing as saying that 68% of the P are going to be, or, or I should say the P hat are going to vary, but 68% of the time, you're, the same interval around P hat is going to include P. Okay, it's, it's two ways of saying the same thing. It's like taking a coin and you know, looking from one side to the other. Uh, the two are related. The distance or the amount of distribution of P hat around P and the distance or the distribution of you know, comparing P hat you know, of P around P hat is gonna be, well, it's, 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 a, it's a similar thing. The one thing I do wanna to be careful with, which I kind of misstated a second ago. So in this case, the P hat are all distributed around P. There's a P hat here and a P hat here. Each P hat is a survey. You go out and you collect, a, you talk to a thousand people, you get a result, that's a P hat. So you might have a P hat there and 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 there and there. All right. The idea is if you take all of those P hats, 68% of them are in this interval. Uh, so I want to be clear here. I'm not saying that the P's move around in here. There's the P is the same. The population parameter doesn't change. The idea is that for each P hat, if you go through and put an interval around it, then it's there's a 68% chance that that the P is going to lie inside of it. All right, let, let me show you a picture. I'm, I'm kind of uh, I think I've, I'm kind of repeating myself. Um, this picture maybe will help to describe it. So what we've got here in this picture right, is there's a, so it's kind of a little, little difficult to understand, but what you've got is 51% here at the very bottom. This is the population parameter. P, that's the population parameter. And then what they've done is they've gone through and done and, and collected like hypothetical or probably simulated surveys with random, in, with random data. And they went through and they graphed the surveys on the same axes here, okay? And they did it for, you know, we'll talk about confidence intervals or confidence levels in a second. I actually meant to do this picture after I talked about confidence levels, but I think I kind of, feel like it's necessary right now what well, we're trying to describe the the idea behind this okay so what they've done is they just have gone through and put a ton of surveys on here and this is with a 95% not 68% so i've been saying 68 again and again but this is a 95% which is two standard deviations all right so what they've done is they've gone through and they've put the surveys on a single axis like this and what you can see is that if you go through and do a hundred surveys, there's a hundred simulations here, a hundred. Okay, if you do a hundred of them with a 95% or two standard deviation, okay, then I think if, you'll, if you count these 96 out of the hundred, so pretty much 95%, very close, 96 out of the hundred um, contain the population parameter. All right, and so that's what that's the way we're thinking about this is that we're thinking of it in terms of if you went ahead and took random surveys and put them with their intervals around the population parameter, then they're going to contain the, the parameter, um, the you know the ninety five percent of the time, the 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 um, 
the amount that you get from the empirical rule, right? So 68% for one standard deviation, 95% for two standard deviations, 99.7% uh, for three standard deviations. So um, the the if you took this if you took a, a randomly selected survey, um, 95% of the time that selected survey is going to is going to its range if you put it around there is going to contain the the population parameter. Okay, uh, so I don't want to get too I don't want to dwell dwell on this too long uh, because there's a certain population. Speaking of population, who's listening to this video, who just is lost and has no idea what we're talking about. Uh, these we're just trying to explain uh, the idea behind what we're going to do, um, and and you know we've we've done that. Uh, now we're going to go through and move on, you know, with how to do it. And the how to do it is really the 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 more important part. Uh, that's the part that you need to be able to do, like homework and tests and stuff. Okay. So all right. So the let's get to that that confidence level stuff. So. What we can do is we can go through and say that, um, assuming this is true, so 68% of the time P will fall into the interval around P hat, what we want to do is we want to construct that interval. So how do we construct that interval? All right, so we need to know what P hat is. P hat is, uh, where is it? Not on this page, 57%. So we've got 57%, that's P hat. We've got our standard error. Uh, this is, which we can rewrite as a percent, 2.3 percent. We want to take those two things together, and we want to use them to create an interval. All right, and what that interval is going to be, so now we're talking about this picture here. We're going to start with p hat, and then we're going to subtract one standard deviation to get this amount here. That's going to form a boundary on one side, and we're going to add one standard deviation here that's going to give us another boundary on this side. And then we're saying that the P is going to be in that's in there 68% of the time. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. So you take 57% minus 2.3%. And we get 54.7%. Take 57%. Add 2.3%. And we get 59.3%. Those, those create the, the endpoints. And so we can say, using the explanation from the previous page, sixty-eight percent. Well, actually, that's not a good way to say it. There's a 68% chance. Sorry. The phrasing is really important here. Uh, and another, or, sorry, uh, or the other way to write this, and it's a little more common, 57% plus or minus 2.3%. All right. So um, one, if you go ahead and take P hat and do plus or minus the standard error that we're estimating, uh, then you can go through and you can construct this range of outcomes. All right, and just like again, so I'm going to repeat myself. So if, if you're if you're struggling um, with all the language, I'm just going to say it again, which maybe won't be helpful. But if you can say that p hat is 68% of the time, p hat is within one standard deviation of p, then you can also say 
that P that there's a 68% chance that any randomly selected P hat is going to contain P in the interval around it. Uh, all right, so so that's that's what we're trying to say here is that if you took a random a random P hat, there is a 68% chance that the interval around that P hat is going to contain P. Okay. That, that, what I just said there is accurate. I don't know if it's helpful or not. All right. Um, and we can extend this and we can go through and say, all right, well, what about two standard deviations? So we can go ahead and we can do two standard deviations. Uh, we can, so we could say there is a 95% chance. That's the, that's the empirical rule for two standard deviations. 95% uh, chance that P is inside. All right, so I did the math for us here. So it's 52.4% and 61.6. And there is a 99.7%, that's the three standard. So when we covered the empirical rule, we basically just said pretty much all. It's not entirely all, it's just pretty much, uh, it's pretty close, 99.7% is pretty close to all. That P is inside. Fifty point one per cent to sixty three point nine. Okay, so um, the idea here is that if we go through and we do a survey. And we, we don't know what the population parameter is. We have no idea what it is. But if we go through and take the result of our survey and we create an interval around it using the result from the central limit theorem, then we can go through and say that 68% um, that of the time P is gonna be in that interval, 95% of the time P is gonna be in that interval and 99.7% of the time P is gonna be in that interval. That's what we're saying is that we can go through and we can create intervals around for our p hat results, and those intervals are likely to contain p um, the various percentage of the time. All right, these things are called confidence intervals. All right, the idea that you create an interval. And you attach to that interval a likelihood that something is inside of it. That is the idea of a confidence interval. So it's the link between this number here and our interval, which actually let's use this guy here. Uh, so this number here, uh, I guess I didn't do the others for the, for the other two. Uh, uh, well, like, let's, maybe we should. All right, so this is 57%. And then two standard deviations would be plus or minus 4.6%. Um, and then for this one, it's 57% plus or minus 6.9%. All right, so what we're doing is we're creating a link between the percentage chance of something uh, lying inside of an interval. All right, and that is a confidence interval. This thing, of course, is the interval. This is the interval in each case. And then what we have here, this other number, this is called the confidence level. That's what I mentioned a second ago. So this is the confidence level. So we have the confidence level and we have the confidence interval. And the two are linked. The higher the confidence level, the bigger you need to have the interval so that you're more likely to contain the, 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 the population parameter, all right? If you have a small interval, 57 plus or minus 2.3%, then you need to have a lower confidence level because you're, you should be less confident that you have managed to do a survey and have that survey results actually be really close to the population parameter, okay? so. That's the name of the game here. Uh, it, when you're doing surveys, you, the idea is that if you went through and did a ton of surveys, you'd get all of the distribution of results and they are around P. 
But if you're picking one at random, then you don't know whether the one you pick at random is going to be the one that is close to P or the one that's far away. And this, the confidence level tells you, you know, creates that link between the two. All right. And so this is saying there's a 68% chance that you picked one that was that was 2.3% closeness to 57. There's a 95% chance if you pick one at random that it happens to be within 4.6% either way of 57. And there is a very high chance, 99.7%, um, that you've picked one that's within three standard deviations. Okay, let me see here. I, I did create a picture for this too. I did do a picture for this too. Okay, uh, this one is not for 57, it's for 50%, but you can visually see the confidence intervals, all right? So the idea is that let's say that your, um, your population, in this case, instead of, let's say that you're at, you, let's say that we do know the population parameter and it's 50%, um, then if you go through and find uh, the standard error around it, 68% um, of, the, of the surveys are gonna be inside this range, 95% inside this range, 99.7% inside this range. And so if you pick one at random, um, if you have a narrow range, then it's more likely that it's, it, then, it, then the, the chance is gonna be smaller that the one that you picked is inside that range, okay? Uh, if you have a, the larger the range, the more likely if you pick a sample at random that it's gonna be in the range. And so that's the key, the key connection that you need to make uh, with confidence intervals is that the confidence level and the confidence interval are linked. Okay, I'm talking way, way too much. This video is gonna be really long because I'm talking too much. All right. So let's see, I wrote a page of stuff here about uh, the way to interpret the confidence interval is as percentage accuracy. I may have already banged this home, but. a 68% confidence interval around a randomly selected survey result p hat should contain population parameter P 68% of the time. All right, so, and I went through and I wrote it for the 95% case too, but you, it's just that you just replace 68 with 95%. All right, and so uh, that's the idea. Let's just move on. Um, so, Let's talk about margin of error. This is a common term if you've looked at a lot of surveys uh, that you see. So what, what is this margin of error in the context of what we've been looking at? The margin of error in the context of what we've been doing is this number, the standard error. That is the margin of error. So in this case, this number here, this number here, this number here, those are all the margin of errors. And you can see there is a link between those and the confidence level. The margin of error gets larger as the confidence, as the confidence level gets larger. So as you become more confident, you need to have a larger margin of error 
to match, to make those match. All right. And so let's kind of just note down some of the things that we've written on previous pages. All right, so we've got confidence level, whoops. And we've got uh, the confidence interval. Yeah, let's do this. I was going to put like this. All right, so the confidence level. So when the confidence level is 68%, that's one standard deviation. So what, that, what does that look like formula-wise if we just represent it as a formula? We take the survey result, we add and subtract the standard error estimate. And we do that once. For 95%, the 95% confidence level, the confidence interval, we're going to take the survey result and we're going to add and subtract two standard errors. And for the 99.7% confidence level, we're going to do three standard errors. And so what we can do here is we can go ahead and we can actually do a formula. Oh, I did a little, did a little note. Uh, so I went ahead and put the, the estimate because I'm assuming in this case that we don't have the actual population. Um, but if hypothetically you knew the population and you were still doing surveys, then this could be just the standard error without the little estimate. And if you don't remember what the estimate is or where that comes from, uh, this comes this comes from the formula, I think it's in actually the second video on from this chapter that's on this subject. Um, the idea is that the standard error, there's two formulas for the standard error. It's either the square root of P times one minus P uh, over N, or it's the standard error estimated, uh, which is the square root of P hat minus one minus P hat uh, over N. All right, and if we don't have the population parameter itself, we can use this in lieu of it uh, because they should be relatively close. All right, um, assuming you're, you've done an unbiased survey, then your p hat results should be congregated around your population parameters p. And so these should, this should be close to this and so that you can estimate it. Um, but that's what that's what the second part is here is it's either the standard error or the standard error estimate. I put the estimate because my assumption is that we don't have the population parameter. If we did have it, you could you would use this instead. This is more accurate. This is a better this is, gives us a better um, um, formula for standard error. Okay, anyway, so we can go through and create a formula from this. Uh, and so we're going to do is take this formula here, and this is going to give us our formula for our confidence interval. So it's p hat plus or minus z star, which I'll explain what that is in a second, times the standard error estimate, uh, where z star is the appropriate z score back from quite a while ago, it's been a while since we've talked about z-score. The appropriate z-score that corresponds to the confidence level. So what you can do is you can go through and you can pick the confidence level and then that will tell you what, how many multiples of the standard error you should use. Uh, and that's the margin of error. So you'd be like, what does this have to do with margin of error? This is the margin of error here. So that's what we're talking about. It, it, it's the thing that differs as the confidence level changes. Um, and it tells you how much, how big a standard, how much standard error to use, like how much, how much of a width interval should you have around p hat? 
So that width of that interval is going to change at, you know, depend upon what the confidence level is. And that's what the formula is for this. So this is kind of, if you're looking for a formula, this is what the formula is right here. This is the formula. I know it's not like the prettiest formula. Maybe it's not your favorite formula um, that we've covered this semester, but this is the formula for creating uh, confidence intervals is that you find a z-score that corresponds to the confidence level, and then you go through and take p hat, add and subtract that z-score times the standard error estimated. Okay, um, and I do have a picture for this. I can't remember, what does the picture for this have? Oh, okay, I remember what it is. So this picture has this, so this, this picture has the confidence levels and then the z-score. Uh, so these things are the z-score here. It uh, tells you how many standard errors to use that correspond to various confidence levels. So if you want to have the 99.7% confidence level, that's three standard deviations or three standard errors. If you want to have 99%, this tells you what to use. It tells you to use 2.58. If you want to have 95%, then you should use 1.96 or roughly two. So you've noticed we've been using two for 95%, but two, but 95% actually goes with 1.96. If you want a 90% confidence level, then you'd wanna use 1.645 standard errors. Uh, and if you'd wanna use 80%, 1.28. These are all things that you could go through and find um, if you go way back to when we talked about um, the empirical rule and, and, uh, and covered um, Z scores and such, you can go through and you can play around with the, um, you can play around with stack crunch, um, you know, go, coming up with, you know, coming up with these numbers. So you could go through and you could enter various, mar you could enter various Z scores and get out um, various area under curve uh, amounts. And, uh, and that would enable you to go through and figure these out. So there's a formula that connects these two that uh, we kind of talked about when we talked about normal distributions. Okay, uh, anyway, so this gives you a table of, of, of uh, margin of errors to use uh, for various confidence levels. Okay, uh, so sometimes I have a feeling for whether the video is really highly esoteric, and I feel like it is up to this point. So let's do some examples Hopefully the examples will make this seem really simple because it's really not that complicated. You just need to take the result from your survey. You need to figure out what the z-score to use. And then you need to figure out what the standard error is. And you put the three things together and you got a confidence interval. All right, so here's our example. In 2018, Gallup, which is another pollster, uh, pulled 497 K through 12 teachers. Oh man, my OCD would, I would have had to do three more to get to 500. Um, in Gallup pulled 497 K through 12 teachers and asked whether digital devices had mostly helpful effects. Forty two percent said yes. Construct a ninety five percent confidence interval for the percent of all K through twelve teachers.
is it plausible that the actual number uh, for all teachers is 50% or higher? All right, so how do you construct a confidence interval from scratch? All right, so there's a couple steps that you need to go through. Hopefully these are not very onerous. All right, so step one, we're gonna end up using the central limit theorem. So that was something that I mentioned at the very beginning um, in, you know, in, in the last uh, example problem we did. So we need to check for the central limit theorem conditions. What are the central limit theorem conditions? One, the survey must be randomly done. Gallup pulled 497. All right, so in my notes, I actually put a note that said that these are random. Random. All right, so the random word is key. It looks like I crossed it up. All right. Um, oh, and I deleted the A. Oh, no. Random. There we go. Uh, so the random, so that's condition one random randomly selected that's that's met uh condition two we need to have a large enough sample that we've got 10 successes and 10 failures so if you take 497 times 0.42 um, i didn't check the math on this but that's going to be way bigger than 10 and if you take 497 times one minus that that's going to be 4.58 that's also way bigger than 10 so our two conditions are met uh those two conditions for size all right, and then the last one is, um, assuming this is done without replacement, then we need to have the actual population be 10 times. And population, let me write it this way, all, all K through 12 teachers, is easily 10 times 497. We easily have more than 4,970 teachers. Um, this is this, I'm assuming this is from the United States. Um, okay, so uh, that's done. You need to go through and do the central limit theorem uh, conditions. So by now, hopefully we're getting good at that since we did that already under the central limit theorem. Step two, uh, once you've done that, uh, what we're gonna need to do is to go through and figure and find the standard error. So we're going to do the standard error estimate. That equals the square root. Take our 42% here. That's 0.42. One minus that over 497. And we get about, let's see, where is it in my notes here? About 2.2%. All right. About that amount. Okay, so once we've done that, uh, what do we need to do after that? So next we need the appropriate z-score. All right, so what we're doing is we're going through and we're, we're constructing this formula. So this part, done, 0 0.022. So next we need this part. So what z-score are we going to use? So we need z, the z-score equals and what is it we got to read through here? That's going to come from the con from the confidence level. What is the confidence level? Ninety five percent. What did the ninety five percent confidence level tell us to use for Z star? This comes from that table a minute ago. One point nine six. A very good question here is: If you use two point zero, are you going to be marked wrong in the homework? I don't know. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, if you do get marked wrong in the homework, maybe try one point nine six, or maybe the homework will tell you. All right, uh, so we've got that. We've got uh, Z star. And the last thing we need is P hat. That comes from, that's from our samples. That's 0.42. And now from here, you just put them all together. All right, so uh, we're just going to construct. Uh, we've got P hat plus or minus Z star SE estimate. So P hat 0.42 plus or minus 1.96 
times 0 0.022. And then from there, it's, you just got to simplify it 0 0.42 plus or minus. Uh, let's see, I got so I got 4.4. .4. We're just going to do 0.044, I guess. Uh, that's that's not exactly what it is, um, but it's that's what it roughly is. All right. And then if you go through and create an interval for that by going ahead and adding and subtracting it, what uh, I got was 0.376. And then 0.464. All right. And then so the... You can use either of these two things as the answer. There's just two ways of writing the same thing. All right, and so what these are, these are, this is, these are our confidence intervals. And they correspond to a 95% confidence level. So what does that mean? Well, this is, this is important. Uh, this is the important part, is the interpretation part, which is why I keep repeating it, even though it's a bit esoteric, maybe a little bit confusing, but you just got to keep thinking about it. And that is, we don't know where the population parameter is uh, relative to 42%. We don't know. The population parameter could be 50%. It could be 43%. It could be anywhere. We've, we're treating this as one of our randomly selected survey results, one of our randomly selected P hats. As such, there is a 95% chance that our actual population, our actual population P is within a range around 42%. And that's this range. All right. Not where 95%, with 95% confident, we can say that this randomly selected uh, survey result uh, did manage to capture uh, the population. It did manage to get close enough to the population so that the population parameter is actually in this range. That's what, so that's the right way to go through and interpret a confidence interval is that the 42% here is a random result. We don't know whether that result is close to the population or not, um, but we can say based upon all the stuff that we've been talking about in this video that, that we could say with 95% confidence. Um, now, there's still a 5% chance that we're wrong. There's a 5% chance that this 42% is very far from the population parameter itself. That would be the case where the population uh, parameter itself is actually 50 and you're way off. Your survey was way off. That's, that, that means it's, it lies in that other 5%. That's why we're not saying we're 100% uh, confident. We're 95% confident that our survey managed to, the interval around our survey managed to contain the actual population. Okay, so hopefully with more repetition, it's making more sense. Um, anyway, that's the idea. That, and that's it. That's the answer. That's all. That's what you need to do, right? So first with these problems, go through, do the central limit theorem conditions. And then afterwards, you want to go through and find these three things. You need to find a, an estimate for the standard error. You need to find the appropriate z-score for your confidence level. And then you need to um, use the given survey result, given the, the, the sample. Um, the, the, given, you need to go through <laughs> and use the result of the survey. <laughs> and then so just take the result of the survey, add plus or minus, the amount of Z scores times the size of the standard error, uh, and that will give you the range. All right, another, another example. So we're going to a previous uh, example. We're going back to the Morse code example. That's from a previous video. So uh, just to refresh, Morse, Samuel Morse, believed the proportion of E's in the English language was 0 
All right. A survey, or sorry, maybe survey is not the right word for it, a sample showed 118 out of 876 randomly chosen red letters. In a modern textbook, were E's. Find a 95% confidence interval. Is Morse's estimate of 0 0.12 realistic? Realistic, is that the word that I used here? Oh, plausible. The realistic didn't sound right. It's Morse's estimate of 0 0.12 plausible. And then the last thing it says, assume the CLT conditions are satisfied. To save us some work. Because like, we already checked them in the previous, uh, in the, the previous time this, exam this uh, example came up. So we don't need to check them again. All right, so if the CLT conditions are already satisfied, we can immediately jump into finding out the three things that we need to create our confidence interval. So we need the SE estimate standard error estimate. So that's the square root. And then we need uh, the, pop, the, the, um, the percentage or the proportion uh, for, the, for, the, for the sample. Um, now it's not clearly given here, but you can find it, all right? So what we want is we want the percentage or the proportion uh, of letters that were E's out of the total. All right, and so to figure that out, if we're told 118 out of 876 are E's, then what we want to do is take those two numbers and convert that into a proportion, like a decimal. And, and it, it's actually not that hard. You just take 118 and put it over 876. All right, if you go through and you do that, the proportion of E's from the modern textbook is about, I wrote it down somewhere, 1.347, I think. Yes, uh, right. So it's about point one three four seven. Did I say one point? Uh, about point one three four seven. All right, and so we can go ahead. That's going to be our p hat. All right, so we've got point one three four seven. One minus point one three four seven over eight hundred seventy six. And we do some number crunching here. What did I get? I got, so I got 0 0.0115349. All right, that gives us our standard error. And then we need a value for Z hat. Sorry, not Z hat, Z, uh, our Z score. The Z score for 95% um, is, was in that table I showed earlier in the video. Uh, that's 1.96, and then p hat is written right here. I, mean, I guess we can just, for completeness, put them next to each other. So p hat is 0.1347. Just put them all together. We've got this, the, our interval notation, sorry, our confidence interval is p hat plus or minus number of, um, the number of multiples of the standard error times the standard error. Okay, so this is the number of standard errors, I guess you could think of in terms of the confidence interval. So 95% corresponds to roughly two, two standard errors. Uh, plug them all in, and you're gonna get 0 0.1347 plus or minus 1.96 times 
0 0.0115349. And so that turns into 1347 plus or minus 0 0.022. Can't read my handwriting. Looks like 6084. All right. And then we can go through and add and subtract this to construct our interval. So if we subtract it, we get 0 0.1121 and 0 0.1573. And we've done some rounding there right, to get from here to here. All right. So both of those are ways of right of doing our confidence interval. All right, and so uh, we've got with 95% confidence, we can say that the population uh, itself is within this range. If you look at the range, it does contain 0 0.12. So uh, Morse codes estimate, totally plausible. 0.12 is within the range. Okay, uh, one more thing in this video. I don't time these in advance, so hopefully we're so hopefully we're short of the hour hour mark. But this might be tall hopes. You'll be able to look at the timestamp, be able to see for sure. Because I try I'm trying to keep them down to keep them under an hour. All right, so uh, the last thing we're going to talk about are finding the sample size for surveys. All right, so suppose you want to conduct a survey and you want to know how many people to interview for a specific margin of error. All right, so let's start off what, you know, we've, we've been talking about margin of error. The margin of error is the thing that we're adding and subtracting from the, our survey result. All right, so that's this thing, Z star times standard error estimate. This is the margin of error. This is how we're getting this thing. This is the thing, this is the, the error the potential, the margin of error around our estimate. You know, um, this example, this thing, that's the margin of error, that's the amount that's around our guess for the actual population. All right, and so we're starting from there. What, what you can do is if you want a specific margin of error, you can create an equation. And so we can go ahead and take the specific margin of error that we want and, and set it equal to Z star times the standard error estimate. And once you have an equation, you can go through and you can solve equations for various things, okay? Um, if you go ahead and expand this, this is M equals Z star times the square root of P hat times one minus P hat. Uh, over n. And so we can get this. Actually, let me go ahead and do this. And so this is a, a formula that you can use. If 
if you plug in the margin of error that you're interested in, uh, and the, the, the amount that the, the text gives is 3%. So this, so 3% is a common margin of error that is desired on surveys. And so you could put 3% here. You could put the confidence inter level that you want. So 95% is a common choice. So you could put the confidence, the, the appropriate amount here for Z, Z star. And then what do you do for P hat? So if you're going through and you're doing a survey, you don't know what P hat is going to be until you actually complete the survey. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick the large, we're going to pick the value that would give us the largest amount of error. Um, and so it turns out if you go through and kind of play around with this, if you pick various values for P hat, so you could try, you could try 0.3, 30%, you could try 0.4, 40%. It turns out the largest amount of error that you're going to get uh, is going to be uh, for when P hat is is 0.5. So if you plug in the margin of error that you want, so if you're doing a survey and you want 3%, you put 3% here, you plug in the confidence level that you want. So if you want 95%, which is normal, you put that, you put that here, you put the z-score for that here. Um, and then and then finally you put p hat uh, here. If you do that, you're going to have an equation where you have um, Everything is a number except for n, and that's the size of the of the um, the size of the survey. And so you can go through and you can solve for the appropriate sample size for your survey. You can just solve for it using this equation. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's what you could do. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to do we're going to create a shortcut. This is this is kind of a, a cool little shortcut, right? So. We're going to leave M alone here. And then for Z star, we're going to do 95%, the 95% confidence interval. But instead of using 1.96, we're going to use two. And if you're like, wait, man, you're going back and forth, make up your mind. Uh, 1.96 is very close to two. Um, and it does, we are going to go back and forth depending upon the situation. So if accuracy is of primary importance, um, when you're creating a confidence interval, you want to use 1.96. But we're going to use two for this derivation because um, we're going to we're creating a shortcut, and you'll see why in a minute. All right, so we're using two. We're using uh, 0.5. We're going to use the largest case for p hats. We're going to put that in here. So 0 0.5 times one minus 0 0.5 over n. And now take a look at this. This is this is I thought this was an eight. Uh, one minus 0.5, that's 0.5. So this is one half, and that's one half. So we have one half squared, right? That's a half, that's a half, a half times a half, it's one half squared, right? You can take this, you can take the square root of this squared thing, and you can pull that out, and so you're going to get two times one half, and then if you pull this out, there's still going to be a, there's a one left, one over n. All right. And so from this, we can get that m, and then this and this cancels, m equals the square root of one over n. And if you square both sides and solve for n, you get n equals one over m squared. And you get this really handy, super simple formula um, for going through and finding a sample size given a um, a specific margin of error that you want. So you can plug in margin of error. And the, the sample size, the amount of people you need to interview just pops right out. It does not get any simpler than that. Uh, let's go through and take an example. All right. How big a survey? For a margin of error. Of 3%. 
And this assume, assumes we're doing talk about 95% confidence interval. Because the point, the whole point of this is to use the formula we just derived. All right, so assuming 95% confidence interval, we can go through and do n equals 1 over 0 0.03, that's 3% written as a decimal, squared. All right, uh, and so that's 1 over 0 0.0009. And if you plug that into a calculator, you get 1,111. You want 3% error, margin of error? Talk to 1,111 people. The end, that's it. All right, so how big a survey for a 2% margin of error? Again, we're assuming 95% confidence interval. Before we do this, should the number be bigger or larger? Should we get more than 1,000? If, if we want a smaller margin of error, then do we need to interview more people or less people? OK, think about that for a second. One, two, three. It should be larger. If you, to, if you want a smaller margin of error, that means a more accurate survey, and you're going to get a more accurate survey with a larger sample. All right, and so we get n equals 1 over 0 0.02 squared. Uh, so we've got 1 over 0 0.0004, all right, which is 2,500. The end, that's it. That's how easy it is to go through and use this, this uh, this uh, formula. I think that's really cool. Uh, but of course, it only works under these specific circumstances. This, this shortcut is only for the 95% uh, confidence interval, confidence level. If you want to use a confidence level other than the 95%, you need to use this more complicated formula. So you could use this formula for finding a 68% or a 99.7% or any other confidence level uh, that you want. You just need to put the appropriate z-score in. The only one that's that's going to work out so nicely as this one is going to be the one where you've got this as a two. That's going that's just kind of crazy. But anyway, um, that's that's the video. So let's see. We'll find out in a minute how long it is. Um, hopefully it's under an hour. That was my goal. All right. So anyway, have a good day and see you next time. Bye bye.